Hey guys, welcome back to the Pharos Fit Podcast. Uh, great to be back with you guys. Uh, we are here today with Ian Markow of Markow Training Systems, uh, one of the kind of world's leading uh, uh, authorities on mobility and breathing as it pertains to strength training. Um, welcome, uh, Ian. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for taking the time, and it's great to have you uh, on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you guys, and uh, I appreciate the little intro there too. I'll, I'll, I'll be a world authority. I'll take it. Leading yeah, take authority. it, take it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's fun, and uh, I, I do want to start off with a little bit of a bio into you. But before we do that, I just want to say, like, for me, it's so interesting because when I first started out, it felt like all of these worlds were divided. You had people who did uh, stretching, and you had people who did breathing, and then you did had meatheads who did strength training and bodybuilding. And the wells didn't like cross over that much, but in the past kind of decade or so, I've just seen more and more integration of people that truly use mobility in the strength training world and breathing in the strength training world as a part as opposed to like separating these things all the time. And of course, people have seen huge benefits from 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 doing that. So I'm I'm thrilled that finally these kind of like worlds are colliding and converging and, and helping each other out. Absolutely, it's a beautiful thing, you know. I, Having more tools in the toolbox isn't a bad thing, especially when you know when to use them. So it's, it, it really is great to integrate everything. Yeah. So, so how did you start out start out in this field? So um, I originally uh, started off by just out of pure necessity. Um, I was in New York City. I was on my peanut butter and jelly diet, running out of both peanut butter and jelly. And um, I needed a job. I was promised a job originally that fell through when I first moved there. Um, so I stumbled into a crunch fitness and I was like, Hey, you know, do you guys hiring for anything? You know, I have a communication degree and, uh, they, uh, I ended up working out there a few times on like a free trial and some trainer walks up to me. He's like, he like looks me up and down. He's like, are you the guy that was asking about a job? And I was like, yeah, he's like, all right, you're hired. You can be a personal trainer. And I was like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. And I like looked down, I had like my matching Jordan outfit on and I'm like, it was definitely the outfit. He was like, you look like a trainer. You'll be all right. So yeah. I literally just started like the next day. How long ago was this? That was like seven years ago. So I, I, I started that day and uh, or the next day and I knew absolutely nothing. You know, I was still just doing like, oh, it's terrible, as we can all attest to. Um, but yeah, that's where I started. Um, I learned a lot there. A lot of people like to kind of like hate on their, their industry start and like, oh, you know, this and that. But like, to me being at crunch and being able to walk up to anybody like under pressure and like, you know, do those cringy, uh, Hey, I saw you on the treadmill and noticed that your foot turned out. I can give you something for that. You know, like right. all those cringy situations really helped me so much and being able to sell myself and market myself and just be comfortable with it. You know, I remember walking up to people that were way bigger than me and being like, this guy doesn't need me. And then like two weeks later, I was training them and being like, yeah, like you really did need me even though you're big, you know what I mean? So that was a really great experience for me. And then from there, um, I inevitably hit the ceiling pretty hard and pretty fast in terms of, you know, hey, you got to sell yourself for $40 less than you're worth an hour just so that we can hit the scales quota because I personally need to hit it for the club. Um, so yeah, let's do that. And like being there in the last day of the month, like everybody's crazy. I was like, I don't need any of this. So um, I eventually got super lucky across from the gym in the building. I was in an elevator and um, somebody uh, kind of like said, Hey, are, are you a personal trainer? Cause I was wearing my crunch shirt. And I was like, yeah. He's like, you know, you should come, um, come and think about teaching a group fitness class for me. And I was like, all right, like this random guy, this probably isn't going to be that cool. And then he's like, here's the address. So I go to the address, it's 200 West in Manhattan. And I go there, I'm like, wow, this is a pretty nice building. And it ended up being Goldman Sachs. So like one of the top banks in the world. And I ended up teaching group fitness at their gym. And then I ended up transitioning to be a trainer there. So that was like a little bit of a higher ceiling, you know, it went from like, hey, you can make $60 an hour, or like you can make 75 or something like that. I eventually got hired at like a job that had gave me like 20 hours on the floor where I just sat behind a desk and I literally just sat behind the desk the entire time and just studied and just learned everything I could possibly learn while they were paying me, which was like the ultimate come up. I always think about that when I walk by like a security guard who's like watching TikTok. I'm like, you should be doing something else that you could, you don't have to be here, trust me. Uh, 
so that was really great for me. I got to work with that group of people, which is really nice. Um, you know, so many smart people, so many introverted people, so many crazy people that like go way too hard and need to be brought back, which was like kind of like the first time me seeing like, hey, you know, not everybody needs hit. In fact, a lot of people need the opposite. And that was a big moment for me. That's when I started first getting into mobility training. I did the FRC cert, um, learned, hey, I'm kind of broken in every way. I suck at all this stuff, but I'm going to go teach everybody on on Monday. Um, so that was good. And then from there, I actually um, kind of like stumbled in through FRC, like the networking aspect of it. I found another uh, physical therapist in the city. His name's Fabian Garcia, and he was huge. He he literally let me into his place. I trained out of his place for free. I worked for him. He mentored me. That was like the biggest breakthrough yet. Um, and I learned, you know, so much from the rehab side of things. We had MMA athletes, we had professional sports and everything and uh, actors and just all the great people that you were able to get in a city like New York were in that place. Um, so that was really cool. And then from there, um, I eventually outgrew that, um, you know, bumped heads with them, stupid things on my part, just being immature. Um, and then I ended up- yeah, I just ended up training for myself out of a private gym, which is obviously where I was destined to be. I, I just am, I've been fired from a lot of jobs. So I got fired from the NFL. So we we fail big. <laughs> kind of boring to be an entrepreneur in that way. So um, you know, and then I then I started kind of thinking about going online and kind of getting ahead of that stuff. So then we started you know doing kin stretch programs online, which has turned into the EBM, which is our subscription model now. And then um, eventually, I just, I just really loved the idea of like how I found a great mentor and being a mentor for other people and helping other coaches was so big. I kind of like the equation about, you know, if you can help one coach who then helps 100 people, you've helped more people than I can by myself. So I really love to see those success stories. So I started mentoring a lot of other coaches and then I became created my own course um, along the way. And uh now I've moved, uh, I originally moved to Miami about five years after being in New York, teamed up with my brother, who's the one who makes everything look cool. If anybody knows any of our stuff, all credit to him. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we kind of built our systems up together. Then I had a kid and now I'm living in Delray, which is an hour north of Miami. Um, Brandon would know, you know, like by our hometown Boca. So um, it's, things are going well and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And do you, uh, is it everything you do online now or do you have like a private practice? So I do, I do work in person, but I'm kind of in that transition where like I have a few of my like great clients in Miami. So I'll split, I'll go down there for like maybe once or twice a week and I'll like knock them all out in one chunk and then drive back or I'll go down there and I'll, I'll do a couple of clients and then I'll play basketball after with my, my old friends that I used to play with. Um, but for the most part, I'm trying to start establishing myself in Delray, but I've just been so slow with it because I have enough stuff online that I don't need to work in person, but I, I can't not work in person because it like takes my passion and my, uh, it's just, it, it, it's, it's so necessary. Like I love working online. A lot of people complain about zoom. I'm actually really great on zoom. I like zoom. I think there's even some advantages like you're videotaping your client the whole time. You can look back at it. They can see it. There's so many good things about it. But at the same time, once I'm in person, I lock in, I learn better. I apply what I, what I learned even better. So the in-person is definitely always going to drive everything for me. Yeah, I think a lot of us have like delved into that online programming uh, world. I know I, I did it a lot for a while. And, you know, as much sense as it makes from a financial and, and, and time point of view, there's just something about like the social aspect of like being with people and seeing them in person that, that is, is so vastly different from just like writing on, online programs. Especially for mobility and posture right. and especially, you know, I do a lot of soft tissue work and there's just nothing that beats great soft tissue work in combination, you know, in conjunction with uh, mobility and strength training done correctly. Yeah, especially when it comes to and connecting with people, right? That kind of personal yeah. connection is just... Uh... Yeah, it's like we got into it because, you know, obviously you got to be a people person to be in this be in this world and that you are energized by people um, and love helping people and you can always scale and transfer that but there you know is something you always gotta return back to home <laughs> yeah for sure especially the and, and I think zoom was actually a really good progression of that for people because 
for me, when I was doing online programming without Zoom, it was the worst. Like I hated it. I never saw the person. We were just like, they were just kind of like a name and we would talk back and forth, you know, like, but when you actually do Zoom with someone, you do sit down and talk to them. It's not as good in person, but like you really can't connect with people at, at a high level and all over the world, which is cool, but it will never, it, it'll never be the same as everything you guys mentioned, especially in person. Yeah, yeah. So Ian, why don't we tell kind of the listeners what it what it is you actually do? Like what, what is your what would you say your speciality is? Yeah, so I originally would 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 say that I was the mobility guy. I think that's how most people would know me early on, or if you've seen stuff on YouTube, maybe you'd say, Oh yeah, Ian the mobility guy. But most people will kind of kind of think of me more as the systems guy now because of how many different things that I pull from. So, you know, I have one client that might be, hey, I want to work on my mobility and we're doing like a kin stretch session or like really looks like mobility. I have another client that looks like he's just training for powerlifting. And then my third client looks like he's doing bodybuilding. So I've tried to learn from a lot of different places and be really open minded with it um, and then just really have all the tools that I need to like identify something that needs to be worked on and be able to use the right tool for it. And most of the time it ends up being some mixture of all those things because you know everybody needs to get better at breathing everybody needs to build aerobic capacity everybody needs to have healthy joints so like and you know i haven't really met anybody yet who's like i don't really want to look good naked so like all those things can easily mesh together you know what i mean it's just a matter of um you know the practice and being able to take the reps and applying it all when you say just for the people listening when you say kin stretch what does that mean so kin stretch is just the um, FRC or functional range conditioning is like one of the main mobility certs created by Dr. Andrea Spina, um, really highly recommend it. And that was like really one of the big rocks that started my career, especially within the mobility world. Um, so his application of FRC in a group is just called kin stretch. So instead of going and being like, oh, I took an FRC class, you go, I took a kin stretch class. So it's really the same thing. It's just a group application of it. Um, and a lot of people might've known me as a kin stretch instructor because, um, you know, we did a, we did a US USA tour um, and we did like we, we've taught a lot of you know in Australia we've done a couple of different tours and teaching classes like that mm. and you mentioned uh, you mentioned obviously uh, breathing and breath work how is that um, how is that integrated into this kind of kin stretch uh, system so within kin stretch it's uh you know they do address breathing but they address it on such a shallow kind of like far out point that i actually think it's one of the faults within um frs or, or within frc or that mobility aspect and fms for that matter <laughs> if we're going down the <laughs> down the line of all of them kind of mentioned but it's kind of pushed to the side in a lot of ways and the way that i see it in a continuum is that you kind of you know unless you normalize your breathing you're not really going to normalize anything so you would it would kind of be more at the forefront for me and that was kind of the beauty of it is when i was doing so much mobility work I was constantly kind of self, uh, you know, auditing myself and saying like, is this really the fastest way to get where I want to go? Is this exactly what I need to be doing with this person? And it led me to looking further into breathing and being like, hey, this person's clenching their butt. They're said that they have a 10 out of 10 stress. They grind their teeth. And now I'm having them irradiate and create as much tension as possible to push into the floor. Like, is this really the first step for this person? Not really. So that's what led me down the, the way of really thinking about breathing and, and starting to integrate that more. Um, so where it fits is really at the forefront, honestly. It's something that I assess in my assessments. It's something that I'm always keeping up with. And, you know, the intervention doesn't have to be that crazy. I think a lot of people think about like, oh, I'm going to do 45 minutes of breathing on the ground. But like, realistically, I'm starting everybody with just like, hey, throughout the day, be aware. Are you breathing in through your nose? Is your mouth sealed? And let's take your mouth at night if you guys have heard about that i'm sure you have it's you know just super simple you tape your mouth at night it makes sure that you nasal breathe all night and we don't have to add to your gym routine you might not change your gym routine at all tape your mouth and you'll hit me up a month later and be like man my life is different like this did you get this from james Nestor, uh his breath book yeah that was that was so good and like just crazy the evolution wise like we're getting to a point where humans are like mechanically uh like breath is to our disadvantage and that we have to really do everything that we can to optimize uh breathing better and specifically through our nose um yeah, yeah and i was gonna say so so practically uh you know 
for the average kind of uh, gym goer or, or I guess athlete as well, what are the kind of key mistakes people make with, with breathing? Oh, Is it man. Just that they don't? We, we can go all day. All right, let's go. So first one, definitely breathing in through your mouth um, unless you're pushing it. So for example, if you go sprint, you're going to, you're going to breathe in through your mouth. That's great. But you, you would, most people would have so much better or they would have much better workouts if they were just breathing in through their nose throughout them. Um, the thing that your breath does is it changes the position of your body. There's it, every single breath is going to change something because you can't bring air in and stay the same. So your structure, your positioning, or what I would think about as your start point is going to change with every breath. So if you think about walking into your deadlift, walk into your squat, you think about your bench press, whatever it might be, your overhead press, and you start that off with a conscious breath, your start position to that exercise is improved. So mm -hmm. There, there should be nothing more important than that, because if you start in a crappy position, you're not going to magically all of a sudden go, oh, now, now I'm in a great position, especially under load. So that would be the first one. And a lot of common mistakes um, I see is um, with abs and core work, pushing your lower back into the ground. Is there a time for it? Absolutely. I'm not saying that your spine shouldn't flex, but when we stand up, we don't push our lower back into the ground. So if every single ab exercise you do, you're just crunching into the ground and losing length, you're not gonna be great at staying long when you stand up because the only pattern you practice is smushing and crunching. So I try to use like, kind of like one of my favorite cues is like imagine you had a unicorn horn on top of your head and then you just think about either your feet or your butt. Keep those things as long, as far away from each other as possible. And when you're pushing your lower back into the ground, those things are coming together, you're crunching. So you'll see a lot of people with no obliques, no TVA, and it's just all six pack, which again, isn't necessarily bad, but I don't think that's optimal. And in a, in a mobility lens, you'd say, oh, well, what movement options do you have? Well, this person only has a six pack option. That's it. Right. So that person's not going to be able to rotate well. They're not going to be able to side bend well. They're not going to be able to do all those other movements that really separate us as humans. Um, another one is tucking your chin. See a lot of people that just tuck their chin for everything. Uh, another cue that I like to think about is imagine that you had, um, you know, a piece of tape right under your chin and it was attached all the way to your Ironman symbol. That's why I use like talk about the stern and most people know that. So if that string is always pulled short and you're tucking it all the time, you're not going to get chest expansion. You need to be able to expand your chest. People that lose shoulder rotation, their shoulder mobility is crappy. They rarely can actually get a good breath into their rib cage. They become belly breathing. There's the next one. A lot of people think diaphragmatic breathing is belly breathing. Every breath is probably diaphragmatic breathing to a certain extent because the diaphragm is going to work at some point. But whether or not your diaphragm and your pelvic floor actually oppose each other, they're, all, they're lined up and they're actually working in a, um, an organized fashion is a different story. So, um, you know, your lungs are not in your belly, they're in your rib cage. So if you're only doing belly breathing, you're probably leaving a lot of stuff on the table. So, um, yeah, that, that, I think that's a good five, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that idea of like, uh, belly breathing, not being enough because you need 360 degrees, you know, that like, and you don't just breathe this way you breathe this way and, and all the way around. Um, so yeah, I see that too. It's like it, people are only chest breathers and so then we train belly breathing, which is a good first step where it's like, okay, so instead of taking it up and through here, can you cue the belly first, but then where does it go? You has to be like a, you know, like you're pouring cup into a, you're pouring water into a glass and it starts at the bottom, but then you want it to fill all the way up to the top. You don't want a glass half empty, you know? We, we, met, we mentioned uh, intensity. Um, at what point do you think it's acceptable to mouth breathe? Uh, so, for example, do you say like, if, if it's a bodybuilding style workout or a strength training workout where we're not, we're not operating it like um, anywhere near, uh, anywhere near uh, VO2 max or anything like that, do you think most of those workouts can be done with nasal breathing? Absolutely, yeah. But I think what would happen is you'd meet a lot of bodybuilders that would say, oh, I don't do cardio because it kills my gains. And they go, well, you're just out of shape. You're not really, you're really good at lifting weights, but you can't do anything else. So they're like, they can't breathe in through their nose because they're out of shape. They look really good. They're really strong, but anything past 45 seconds, they're not that in shape. So right. that's where they might do some zone two. They might work on their breathing and then they'll go back and be like, well, you know what? My fifth set of deadlifts felt like I could do five more sets. And I usually am dead at that point. It's like, yeah, because 
now you have those heart gains, your body's able to recover faster. So it all feeds into each other, which is again, like back to our original conversation. But to answer your question more specifically, um, you know, somewhere around maybe zone four, zone five, so thinking in heart rates, you know, like you'd want to get to there, which, you know, I would expect someone who's working at a one rep max or a three rep max to get around those because it should be that intense to lift, especially with a, a compound lift. Um, but for the most part, especially in between sets, like if you're breathing in through your mouth between all your your in between sets like i would say that there's some some gains to be left on the table both um muscular uh, like hypertrophy wise because of the positioning is probably not that great and then even more so like i said it's probably an indication that you would benefit from doing cardio and i'm talking about 20 to 40 minutes a week maybe two sessions of 20 minutes like you don't even need to get crazy just starting there and i've seen a lot of people have huge gains just from that do you work with many uh, crossfit athletes not as much anymore, but I've worked with fair, a lot of them in my, in my time. For sure. Yeah. And one big thing with CrossFit is the Valsalva breath for everything. So it's like they use the same breath at 50% as they do at their one rep max. And it's the, you know, and creating a lot of intra-abdominal pressure and thinking that that's going to help them where it's like, it, maybe if you exhaled through the full range of motion at lighter percentages, you get, uh, you know, you have a lot more engagement, you have a lot more capacity. You can probably go for a lot longer if you're a, a CrossFit athlete, obviously, you know, you're barbell cycling and doing all of that. And you're probably going to be more successful with a, a more consistent non-Valsalva breath than that, you know, breath every single rep. Yeah, I think the uh, the task rep the the task mirroring you know your intent is really important. I think that's basically what you're saying. You know, like the thing about CrossFit is like they don't turn anyway, so like they get away with it, and they all look like wide bricks because they don't ever turn anyway. But they do so well with that because they can still pull because they stretch, they work on their mobility, right? They can still get low and deadlift, but they can't turn at all. You know, the one exercise in CrossFit that's not in the sagittal plane is you jumping sagittally over a barbell and jumping back still not turning so you know like those though they, they get away with that and it's fine for them and it works but my argument would be that they would probably do even better if they actually worked on rotating better and they would probably uh you know mitigate some chances of injuries just by restoring those movement options that they've been missing and i think learning to recover better as well like you know when you have those short breaks or you know breaks between sets or breaks between efforts, like learning to breathe properly in your rest periods to improve your rest and recovery is, is a huge thing in CrossFit because you see a lot of people like, they'll get off what they're doing and they'll just breathe. Like rather than, and the heart rate will continue to stay high because they're breathing in that kind of panicky way as opposed to like thinking about calming everything down, breathing through the nose, exhaling through the mouth and just and just controlling it more. Um, yeah. I, see, that's, I see that a lot. I do that yeah, where I'll have to do them like tempos on the sled and then like, all right, you have 40 seconds before you're going to start again. I want you to only nasal breathe. And then like by the eighth round, they're like, I can't. It's like, don't panic. 20 seconds in, you'll be able to again. That's what I want. Next round, 15 seconds in, try to get yeah. there. So you're like using those numbers to get it down. That's a great point. And that's such a great cue for coaches because I feel like a lot of times it's like the coaching or the cueing comes in the work and then the rest period is talking about the work as opposed to talking about the rest. Like how do you know, okay, there's form and there's technique and there's different positioning and all of that kind of stuff that you want to tap on in the actual work. But how should someone rest, you know, and what position should they be in? Should they be all hunched over, crouch forward on the floor, dying and then, okay, rest. Okay, now we go again. Again, um, you know that there's a lot of like missing coaching um, that isn't happening in the rest periods because coaches aren't necessarily like cueing how it is that they should be recovering. How to rest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a fun one for cardio is uh, like progressive sprints. I uh, would do like, okay, so we're going to go at a really light pace and I want you to just nasal breathe and see if you can't, like how far can you go? At what percentages can you get to your uh, upward sprint by just nasal nasal breathing and yes you'll get to the point that you're kind of huffing and puffing and maybe panicking but can you train that ability at your lower percentages to just nasal breathe or like you know to go out for a run and to challenge yourself to just be in through the nose and out through the nose or out through the mouth depending on how y'all feel about that um and uh and 
you know, save the save the sprint for when save that uh, that for when it matters, you know, for when you really, really need it. Yeah, I love it. Where, where do you stand on the whole ice bath for breathing thing? Do you incorporate that at all? Or? Yeah, I don't incorporate it myself, but I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in it. Um, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, similar to like you were just talking about the sprinting, like uh, everything is really just stress. You yeah. know, your body barely knows the difference between what type of stress it is. Right. Um, even with all these little variables that we all argue about on Instagram, it's really all just stress. So like you don't want to have too much of it, but you definitely want to have enough of it to create an adaption. And I think um, another thing that you you just shine light on is like the idea of that mental aspect of the recovery where it's like I am panicking right now and I need to bring myself back. So the ice bath to me represents that perfect panic to, hey, calm down. Yeah. And um, I think the research from what I've seen, you know, is, is pretty clear on it. And it just makes a lot of sense to me. So I, I'm, I'm big on that. Um, we actually just moved into a house. I have a Florida room, which is kind of just like an open room in the back that's, uh, you know, screened in. And I would love to get a, uh, it's unbelievable how expensive they are. But yeah. my, one of my buddies did the, uh, the, the conversion from like the really nice huge Yeti and just cocked it and then turned it into an ice bath. So I think I'm going to do, do that eventually. Yeah, I mean, you can pay up to twenty grand for those things. I, I, it's I, insane. I saw the, the one that Joe Rogan has. I, I googled it the other day. It's like literally twenty five grand. I was That's like, absurd. Yeah, my whole thing with ice bath is I just don't like being cold. It's just my least favorite for you know. I feel the same way about cupping. Actually, I'm like, but there's so many great recovery tools. I just don't want to go through life with a bunch of pepperonis on my back, and I don't like being cold. <laughs> <laughs> So moving it, uh, moving it kind of back to the, the mobility side of things, uh, what are some of the common, the common flaws that you see and the most common problems that you have to try and uh, correct? Uh, definitely hip and shoulder rotation. Um, mm. Almost, and like you can't, the amount of assessments that I've done is a lot. And the amount of assessments that I've done that actually have someone who it's like, wow, you have great hip and turn rotation is like so far, it's like, such a low number it's pretty incredible honestly so i think for the most part most issues with people actually come from a lack of internal rotation whether it be at the shoulder or the hip um you know oftentimes you see people shrugging or hiking their shoulder up and that's yeah. because they can't get the internal rotation so they try to move up and over it mm -hmm. same thing at the hip the hip hikes up because they can't get it um, when you have one hip hiked up and then you try to squat, you're going to squat away from it. If you don't have internal rotation in your hip and you do a squat, you're going to shift away from that hip because you don't have room there. So you go and shift into the other one. Not a big deal body weight, obviously, but over or under maximal loads, probably not going to be the, the best thing for you. Um, so I would say that internal rotation is probably the, uh, the biggest thing that I see missing in people. Um, a lot of it, though, and the beauty of the FRC and kin stretch stuff is like a lot of people just don't have that baseline of motor control at all. Like they've never tried to lift their big toe only, but they've had like plantar fasciitis their whole life. It's like, how, how did you not get to the point where you're like, maybe I should try to move these things, you know? So like, you know, just moving your ankle in a circle, um, being aware of what your elbow can do, like all these little things and these baselines that you would basically do with cars, which is controlled mm -hmm. articular rotations. There's like joint circles, you know, like for most people just starting off with that is like, I mean, it's just such a game changer and it, it, it can be 15 minutes a day. Um, you know, it's free. You can find on YouTube. I can send you guys the link for ours. You can just YouTube Ian Marco cars. It comes right up. So, um, you know, I think that those are the two biggest ones is restoring internal rotation and, uh, just general body awareness. Like, uh, you can even think about the cat cow, right? Like how many yogis out there do cat cow every single week, arguably every single day. But when you ask them to move each one, one by one, it's just like a big chunk or they just drop their ribs to the ground and their spine barely moves. Yeah, they got good low back mobility, but they can't segment their upper back or even neck at all. Yeah, it's just all chunked together. And, you know, everybody starts off with four chunks. But, uh, you know, if you keep working on it, you eventually have 10 chunks and 10 chunks moves a lot better than four. And that's for sure. Yeah. Dissociating, yeah. dissociating is another one that you could really say is like, 
I, a lot of my training will be like reciprocal stuff or alternating. So like things like one arms reaching, one arms pulling, and they, they alternate and reciprocate. And when you do stuff like that, you'll see that like people can't just move their ribs. They have to move their ribs and their whole head comes. They have to move their ribs and their whole hips move. So being able to dissociate would be another big thing, like moving one thing without the rest of everything coming along. Just like you would go and play golf. You know, it's not a, it's, it's not a wonder why people go and like hurt their neck when they play catch with their friend for the first time in a while they hurt their back playing golf their neck pulls when they're doing you know baseball or whatever it might be softball and it's that ability to keep your eye on the ball but have your whole entire rib cage turned without it and a lot of people are missing that for sure yeah, I love that you answered internal rotation first because I feel that way too, where it's like, and a lot of people don't think about it because when you're squatting or when you're deadlifting, mostly when you're squatting, it's every coach's cue is um, push your knees out and everything's okay. Let's maximize external rotation. Oh, you got tight glutes. Okay, we need more external rotation. <clears throat> but I have never met a person with low back pain that didn't fail internal rotation. Like they may have external rotation, but they can't internally rotate. And you're right, then they compensate by laterally flexing their spine, lifting, lifting it up and it's like if you f just focused on the internal rotation both of that and the shoulder you know in the uh in the athletic or CrossFit space, the biggest thing, you know, the most elusive exercise is the ring muscle up or the ring dip. And, you know, it's like you can't, the amount of people who fail, even basic, like, you know, they say you need 70 to 90 degrees of internal rotation, even 45 could get you by, but there's so many athletes that can't even get to 45 degrees of internal rotation without a hike of their shoulder, or a lift up and over or trap engagement. So yeah, I loved that answer. Um, I know Emily has. Have you been, um, over the years, somewhat shocked at how how good athletes can be at their sport, but how bad they move? <laughs> yes. yes and no. Yes, <laughs> overall. But, you know, I think, you know, there, there's the weight room doesn't necessarily transfer over. So I think you see a lot of athletes that are really great in the weight room. And then you see a lot of athletes that are really great on the field. And those things don't necessarily always mirror each other. Not that athletes don't need a strength trainer. The weight room's not important, but I think that it's, it's really a case by case basis. But when you put them to do the tasks that they really need, they're good at, you know? And I, I also think even more so what I've been shocked at is how, how good athletes can really be at getting things done in their own way because what's a compensation in the weight room is really Patrick Mahomes being able to throw with the wrong hand while he's falling down getting tackled you know right so kind of like, right they make it work the body will find a way yeah and that's what's cool about the mobility training is because when you boil it down to its basis it's just to give you more viable options like what how what what can your shoulder do in as many ways as possible so that when you actually need to use that option you have it versus hammering the same line every time of those 10 exercises that maybe you've been doing over years and now you don't have those other options to get to so yeah i would say that that surprises me even more uh, I haven't looked at the, what is it, TB20, Tom Brady's program, whatever it is. Um, you know, he puts a lot down to the mobility as being the reason why he's had such longevity. Um, have you seen that, what, what his program, what he does? And do you, do you think? So I've actually interacted with it in like 10 different ways. I've had like a client go and do it. I had, um, you know, the, uh, the company I was working for tried to partner with them. So um, I think... Um, I think they, it's a very low risk uh, uh, approach, which I think honestly would work really well, especially when you get to the NFL, because by the, by the time you get to the NFL, it's not like, Hey man, you're kind of, you're, you're really not that strong. You know, we, we, right. like you're probably not really that strong. We should get, you know what I mean? So like right. most of these people just need to keep getting better at the actual sport. They're already doing that. So right. what can we do outside of that? That doesn't end up being too much but also keeps them moving, maybe restore some things. So that's where, like you said, the soft tissue work can really help them um, moving in different spots, rotating, you know, mirroring your sport, but also giving more freedom outside of it. Um, so that's kind of why I would say that that works. But I mean, if you're going to have a, a, a golden boy to go off of for durability and longevity, it's kind of hard to beat Tom Brady. So yeah. you know, he's, uh, he's doing it. Yeah. Do you have, uh, this is kind of a 
kind of a personal question. Do you have any experience with uh, turf toe? With what? Turf toe. Have you heard of turf toe before? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not specifically. Um, no, not specifically uh, in terms of actual turf toe. Um, I've had, I've worked with people that have every other foot injury, but no, not specifically with actual turf toe. Yeah, I'm just curious because I've had, I've had this issue forever now with my with my right foot. I've got this turf toe issue, so I'm, I'm wondering if there is a. I mean, when you research it, most people say, yeah, you kind of like there's nothing you can do about it. It just it just is what it is. But I'm like, there must be something. Oh, there's definitely something. I mean, you would definitely want to check the way that your foot's pronating and supinating. If it's the right foot, do you find yourself turning your right foot out all the time? Yeah, yes, for sure. Always, when I squat, yeah. Always. You're probably you're probably struggling with pronating in that foot. Um, getting it straight and allowing the foot to really spread out on the ground, doing some pronation drills like that would help. Um, you might want to check and see if your calcaneus is moving really well. It needs to tip forward in order for pronation to occur and tip in a little bit too. So that's commonly missed. Oftentimes, I think I think uh, a lot of the toe injuries are very similar to what we're talking about with the internal rotation before. You got to think about like your body moves in arcs. So it's like external rotation, internal rotation, external rotation. When my foot hits the ground and heel strike, I'm in X, I'm biased towards external rotation. When my knee comes forward, my body shifts over my midfoot. I internally rotate. Internal rotation is when you're putting force into the ground and then your arch is gonna come off of the ground. You're gonna externally rotate. So those are kind of like the phases of gait. So you're probably missing one of those. And off of what we talked about, it would be pronation going along with internal rotation. When that happens better, you'll come back off of the ground and save that big toe a little bit better. Oftentimes it's because when people have big toe stuff, it's probably because they're too far forward all the time. So you might need to do something that brings you back in your workout um, the, a goblet squats, the easiest example, anything that's reaching base because you're reaching, you're retracting your rib cage. I like to think about it as similar to the conversation about the breathing. When you change your start position, you're going to have a better, uh, chance of successfully moving forwards and backwards. You can't get where you're already going. So if you find yourself in like a, if you were to do your posture picture right now, your right foot was turned out and you notice that your whole entire body was kind of leaning forward, then for sure, that's where I would start with that. Because again, you can't get where you already are. So you're going to try to go forward in life, but you're already there. And that's just going to keep jamming on the big toe and overloading it. Right. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. What are the worst mobility exercises that you see people doing? <laughs> The 90-90 uh, when you have five degrees of hip and turn rotation is at the top of the list. Like for some reason, the 90-90 has become the standard or the thought of like, this is mobility and it's a great exercise. It's a great base position. The options are endless and I use it all the time. But when you first start off and you don't know how to lift your big toe, you can't really do a hip car, you don't really have any hip extension, and then you put yourself in this really advanced position, it's like just the progress is so slow and the chance for actually going backwards is really high. Um, so that would be the first one. Would you say that that person should start standing, doing hip cars, single single leg hip cars before? And then how do you feel about 90-90s while hands behind you? Because that's usually where I start, where you're not totally upright, that your hands are back behind you. So that way you can kind of let that, uh, like you're not in as deep of an angle. Absolutely. It's definitely way better. But in my experience, what I would do is standing hip cars and just spending more time on that would be better. But that's really the beauty of it is like, that's it's it, the positions are kind of on a continuum, right? Whereas the 90, 90 would be the highest on that continuum. It's the oh, furthest right. on the line. So yeah, regressing, it would put you further back on the continuum, but there's probably a figure four for, for external rotation. That would be better. There's a sideline um, hip IR that would be better for internal rotation. So I would just probably regress those positions even more. Um, and that's not to say that, uh, what we're talking about too is like the fastest path because in my opinion like you you can hammer the that's the other thing about the mobility trains like you can hammer away at it forever you know like you can hammer away for three years your body's gonna adapt it's gonna fold some way for sure and you're gonna get changes but i found a way faster way where you would get those changes and more in way less time and that would go with something like that with a regression where they're maybe focusing on their hip cars more. Maybe I put them in the 90-90, but they lean back and they just do transitions. 
but they don't necessarily stay there for pails and rails and do isometrics there and do liftoffs and all that other stuff like the 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 lift your back foot for hip ir lift off is another one that like yeah it's a great exercise but like we just talked about people hiking up their hip and rolling forward what's someone going to do as soon as you get them in there they just hike forward and roll out of the way so it's like oh so the compensation i'm trying to avoid in your assessment i'm programming in my intervention well that doesn't really make a lot of sense you know what i mean so yeah that would be the 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 biggest one that i see and uh yeah that, that that would probably be the biggest one just start just in general just starting too far along and not spending enough time on the basics which i think is kind of a microcosm of fitness in general right totally yeah, right sure. they and let it, you said that it's that they want the fastest path so like the 90 90 is like the quintessential you know thing and um and really like complex and you get a lot of bang for your buck especially if you're already able to get into the range um but if you're not then where do you start and yeah to a very good point i always think of it like a bow and arrow like you got to pull back in order to spring forward baby <laughs> yeah and even the 90 90 you can put blocks in it you can lean back like there's regressions but like you rarely ever see those yeah and i mean i've, I've had countless clients that like early on i put them in the 90 90 for so long i just kept thinking to myself like once you retest like why isn't this person getting that much better like yeah they feel better but they're not really getting better in the measurable things that i'm supposed to be going after and i realized it was because that position was too advanced for them and it's just they needed something else and then once they got something else they took off and they made so much more progress and it was like oh this is what i needed to do right regression yeah. for progression what are your what are your thoughts on the kind of knees over toes uh, revolution I, I love the guy. Um, I think he's such a stand-up guy. The way he's handled all the hate, the uh, the, the stuff. Um, he's an incredible marketer, like one of the best of our generation, honestly. Um, if you think about the come up that he's had and yeah. the amount of money that he must be making at this point, it's astronomical. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, to me, it's also really basic, honestly. Like. Yeah. It, it, you know, I love how it's scalable, right? Everybody's, we were just talking about this, like you can, you can hate on any of his stuff, but there's a regression for it that someone could do. Like, oh, you can't, this guy just does sissy squats with everybody. Yeah, but you start with just bending your knees standing up, like, you know, like that's it. So it's, it's, it's got a great entry point for everybody. Um, I think that him, he personally, you can't always do this and say like, Hey, this person's great. So their, their training's great. But I mean, he's got a lot of success stories. Um, I think there's a lot of people that will jump into it too fast and do things wrong and probably end up, um, maybe, uh, holding themselves back in some ways, but overall I, I have no issue with it. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen him takes the other thing is I think one of the great measures of, of, of trainers and people is like to see. The, the internet is so toxic, like, especially Instagram, like some of the stuff that I put up and then someone just, it's like, how did you even get here to say this? this is unbelievable. So like to see him get bashed so often, get mean and just like, I've never seen him say one bad thing or react right. to it. I just have so much respect for that. It's kind of like LeBron, you know, like what the worst thing LeBron did was buy a Hummer and when he was in high school, like, like, come on, you know what I mean? Like he, yeah. it, it, your tra his track record is really solid. And it, uh, it's just scalable strength training in full range of motion. That's all it is. And what's, I, what's, can, I can get behind that. What's fascinating for me is because I, I was uh, like a student of Poliquin back in the day, Charles Poliquin. Um, I did the PICP uh, level one, level two and the biosig back in the day. And a lot of the stuff that he's saying, these over toes guys saying is the stuff that Pollockin was saying back then. So again, a lot of this stuff is nothing new. Like he's just re-energizing it and putting a focus back on it. And it's just always interesting how the industry goes like this. It just like flows one way and then people remember something and they go back and it's like, oh, um, and I, don't, I don't know why we ever get away from the stuff that, that does work because I do a lot of the knees over uh, toes stuff and it, it does work. It's been very effective for me. Um, but I used to do it a lot um, back in the day when Pollock was teaching it and I kind of like got away from it, especially stuff like the Peterson step down and stuff like that. Like he was pushing that hard back in back in the day. Um, and those, the, those uh, knees over toes lunges with the raised heel, he was pushing those hard back in the day. And it's kind of gone in this kind of secular thing where, like I said, we, we got away from it for some reason and then he's, he's just bringing the focus back to it. Um, and I think both, a lot of it was from, I think both guys like 
did a lot of Eastern uh, Eastern mythology, uh, Eastern Eastern mytholo- method- methodology, methodology uh, <laughs> research. Um, it, it's what cured them. It's what and the same thing with uh, Louis Simmons from Westside Barber. That's how he fixed his back. Like going outside the box, saying, "Okay, this Western methodology is not working for me. There must be some more information, some more literature out there that I can research." Go outside the box, find it, and then and then bring it back and try it and experiment with it. And I thought I thought that with the knees over toes guy. I, I thought the the thing was fascinating about him um, going getting rehired by a, a, a an NBA team and them saying you can't train that way you have to train our way and him saying no this is what works for me I'm not and why you going hired back to me that. this is why <laughs> and them saying well it's either do it do it our way or, or don't do it at all it's like well fuck you then I'll go and do my own thing and and, and teach people how to do this method which what team was it I didn't know that yeah, yeah. I, I don't know I can't remember the team I was, I was, uh, yeah I was listening to a podcast because he he obviously got he was obviously in so much pain in the beginning that he got dropped. Then he went away, retrained himself, improved his vertical jump, improved everything, went back into trials, got rehired, but they said, we want you, but you can't train like that. And he's like, thank you, but no thank you. I'm going to go go and go and teach this method to, to the world. And, and uh. Which is probably why he's so cool, calm, and collected these days with the haters, you know, because he's had so much. It, it, but it's crazy how some people are like, nope, it's this way, or this is the only way, as opposed to being like, well, maybe if we pulled from a little bit of here and a little bit of there and kind of built, like you said, a system of all these different things and didn't just think, you know, linearly or narrowly in one one way, then all the athletes might be better because no athlete's the same and no one way will work for everybody. Yeah. And the, the proof's always in the pudding. It's like, there's a, there's a great quote from Don jo- uh, Dan John where it's like, people will argue with you and you just say, try it and get back to me. Like, that's it. Just try and get back to me. Same thing with ice baths. Like, there's a lot of people who are like, say, ice baths don't really work. They're not really very good. They're this, they're that, the other. It's like, just go and fucking try it. Get back to me. Tell me if you feel better. Like, because most people will always feel better when they when they do an ice bath. Much like that, if a lot of people try some of this knees over, uh, knees over toe stuff, they'll feel better. Even though like their research or whatever they believe in terms of science might not agree with it. Um, you know, if you just do allow yourself to open up a little bit and uh, take away some of your preconceived conceptions of what's right and what's wrong, um, you can improve uh, no end with a little bit of open mindedness. Um, what? Sorry, you can. Well, sorry. It's like he has questions. I didn't. I never saw the questions, so I only have my own questions. <laughs> um, yeah. um, I wanted to talk about stick mobility on that same on that same vein. I know you're really big into stick mobility, and that I would say we have a lot of like a, you know similar. Uh, we've been you know taught by the same people and gone down a lot of the same paths. And stick mobility is actually something that I have never gotten into at all, um, and I'm like super fascinated and intrigued by it. So, how did you get into that? Um, how have you found that that is the you know that how do you use it um do you think that it's better than certain other things and yeah just i'd love to hear your insight on that that's a great question first and foremost i love those guys like dennis is the man he's such a great guy when i when i was first doing like workshops i reached out to dennis and i and he basically like gave me like a free business call on everything that i needed to know and, and so much of he was so helpful neil's awesome too so they're a great company to support first and foremost, um, and arguably most important, honestly. Um, you know, the people behind it are really important to me. Um, but the actual system itself is awesome. It's so great because the stick is kind of a cheat code in a lot of ways. Um, we talked a lot about people not being able to control their body, but what it really does is it kind of makes it more of a closed chain exercise simply by putting your hands on something. So creating tension or in some ways relaxing tension or putting stretches on some things. For example, like if you're trying to, you know, stretch out your lat and just like putting it on the ground, it's gonna be way different when the stick is actually pulling you back into that stretch. Mm -hmm. Um, It also is resistance. I think a lot of people look at that, they're like, oh, look at this little stick. And then like when they actually try to push the stick and bend it, they're like, oh, it's a little harder than I thought. So um, that's another really great aspect of the stick. There's positions that you can't get into unless you have the stick. And those positions can be trained at a a higher level because of the stick. 
um, having one end pushing into the ground, the other one's pushing your hand, and then you're pushing it across your body. Um, all those different things come into play, and it's really a phenomenal tool. And then, you know, the other thing about it is it has a lot of utility as uh, just like a really expensive stick. You know, I, I find myself using it a lot like that. And I, I, I just think that that's a great thing too. Instead of having like this crappy wooden stick, you have this really nice one in the corner, you know, and, um, you know, using it to drive tension to the ground and, and all the different ways that it's there. Um, yeah, they really did a good job of building a complete system all around the tool, which I think is actually pretty rare these days. Um, you see a lot of really gimmicky things. It's like, hey, we can make your split squat worse by using this tool. And it's like, yeah, why would I do that? You know, where as you use the stick and it actually makes things better and um, even opens up new possibilities. So overall, A plus, I, I love them. We should get so, one. So to, just for the people that are listening, I don't know what the fuck you guys are talking about. What, <laughs> what is stick mobility? So it's just a really, it's, it's just like you would use a PVC pipe. Exactly. That's all I've been using. This PVC pipe, it's got like hockey tape on both ends that are like really well made. So that it's grippy and the stick actually bends. So you're able to actually push into it. It pushes against you. It adds resistance. And it really is just a, a really well-made stick, but with the way that they teach their system, it becomes so much more than that. And you end up being able to add it to, to everything and anything, honestly. Yeah. So the key takeaways I took from you are um, the uh, resistance within stretching, which I think is huge. I, and a lot of the framework of like all the work that I see you do, you're not just like passively or dynamically stretching things. You are um, using like counter stability and then uh, and, and finding that mobility. And then it sounds like really great for rotation that like, you know, where you don't just stretch your lats from top to bottom that you can um, stretch and reach and rotate within and find a uh find a range that you can't get into so i think we should get a stick peter can I you buy one for me please how, buy how, one how much these <laughs> they're probably like 200 dollars. i don't know like you said a very expensive stick <laughs> i'll send you guys a discount code it's it's in um the other thing that's honestly so sneaky good about it is like right where you guys are right now like you have it behind you and you're on a call and you just end up standing yeah. with it and turning with it and rotating with it. That is, it feels so good. And it's like such a low key thing. And it's like one of those things where like, yeah, you could do cars, you could do all these other drills, like for sure. But like when you're sitting at your desk and like your stick just looks at you in the corner, you're kind of like, all right. And you kind of find yourself using it a little bit more. And honestly, it, it's really great in that like little like movement snack 10 to 15 minute way too also or like a warm up for your a warm up or say you just did a bunch of pulling and you just want to hang from it too like hanging is a really great exercise but again progressions you have someone who can't get anywhere near overhead and they're just hanging on for dear life like crooked like this wow. the whole time. Like, that's not going to go that well but the stick you have it out in front of you so it has less shoulder flexion and now you can hang from it so it's it's also very scalable in that way yeah, we should we should take one on the road with this one yeah. of those sticks, and it won't get here by Tuesday, but yeah. <laughs> um, what was I gonna say? Oh, stuff like uh, are you familiar with Romwad things like that? What uh, Romwad? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about stuff like that? Like these kind of like um, online kind of like mobility programs. That Is it like... a mobility program? Is that? Well, that's the, that's 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 my question. Like, <laughs> or is you, it just a series of stretches that yeah. gets people to do? Because people will people will like people will not not seek out experts. Yeah, I don't know too much about it, but um, you know, I think there could be some benefit to it because um, I think it would just get people out of their normal patterns. I feel like that's kind of like a hey, we do yoga, but we love CrossFitters, kind of like that's kind of their, their brand. Doing something you know? is better than doing nothing. Yeah, right. so I think it would be better than, than nothing. And, and I think that it could work out like that. Uh, do I think that they're executing at the highest level? From what I've seen, no. Um, my last client that I had was like, hey, I was doing Ramla. And then I was like, all right, cool. And then we started working together. And a week later, he's like, yeah, man, I'm really glad I called you because like that stuff was not that great and nowhere near as specific as what we're doing. So yeah, specificity you know. is a big one where it's like it, they did a great job of, I think, being first on the market to um, online, quote unquote, mobility programs. Um, but yeah, they haven't really evolved since they started. 
Do you? Right, right, right. Yes. But even then, there's so many stuff that Kelly Starrett did that kind of paved the way that I think even missed the mark where now it kind of just turned into like, okay, hold this pigeon for two minutes. Now switch. Now hold this elevated child's pose and da, 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 you know, where it's like, but how are you integrating into a full body experience that like, yeah. yeah. He's another one that I should have mentioned in the beginning because he, I, when I found Supple Leopard, that was when I was like sitting behind the desk getting paid to study and like, I just loved him so much, like the way that he carried himself. And I loved when he would do videos and like his toes would be painted pink and he'd be like, you know, my daughter did that. Like, you know, like little things like that that got me in. He he did such a good job of marketing himself and for sure. Yeah. That was going to be my next question, actually. The when you were doing that studying self-study, like, do you have some recommendations of some self-study or, uh, you know, I uh, know you mentioned the certifications and stuff like that. But what do you think are the best things on the market now for somebody to um, empower themselves um, into learning more about this kind of stuff? Well, I'll shamelessly just say that me going through all the resources that I've gone, I've created our course based off of that. So I'll just say that. But then other than that, like when I was studying back in the day, I was reading T Nation articles. You know, I wasn't exactly hitting the gold nuggets every day. Let's say that, you know, so like there's a lot of stuff that I, that I, that I, that I learned that I probably unlearned at the same time. But, you know, a lot of coaches really hate on certifications and I, I just don't see why I, I love certifications. I love doing courses. I love doing courses on the weekends and going and meeting people and being being in the environment and, and, and sometimes when you go to a course, you might take away three things that you use for the next year or two. And I think that that's worth it alone. But what really happens is those three things are great, but the three things that you learn outside of it, when you're working with other people, when you're talking to them, when you're picking something up, even just seeing the way someone carries themselves that might be further along in their journey can be so valuable from that weekend that like, I'm a huge fan of that stuff. Um, I really like the, um, I like the mentorship courses. Um, honestly, like there's a lot of them going out there to me, you kind of just find someone who's doing what you want to do. And then you just kind of hit them up and be like, can I pay you so that I can learn? And then they send you a link and say, Hey, you should sign up for my course. You know, like it's really, I I think that that's a great thing. And, uh, I've learned so much like that. I wish there was more courses back then because I would have been doing them instead of being on T nation. I'd be even further along. Um, I do. I do think. I do think I do think right now there's a little bit of an issue with it in terms of um, people have realized how much money they can make from it and they're not necessarily specialists in their field but I see all these adverts for I need five men who over the age of 40 who want to lose 20 pounds of fat and gain 20 pounds of muscle click this link kind of thing so you have to be a bit careful with it um, although I completely agree with you like there's so many courses that are like would be great to, to, to learn from and have great value. But that was good advice to be like, find the person, not the course. Find the person that you are, right. that, find that you look you up to trust them. and ask them what they're doing. Don't just like go and Google this course because you're going to find a million different courses and then you'll have to kind of backtrack and be like, okay, but who's at the helm of this course and do I actually trust what it is that they, they're putting out there? Because one of the interesting things we've come across is, and this is why we're, tra- we're trying to like enhance our kind of educational platform platform is because there isn't really a good um, coaching slash personal training program anymore to take you from the very basic NASM certification to practically working in the gym space. Um, you know, there are a lot of different courses here and there, but it's like I, people ask me all the time, where shall I get certified in terms of I want to be a coach, I want to be a personal trainer, where shall I get certified? And I used to know, but these days, like, I don't think there is really one great like resource you can go to, to, to become a great trainer. Yeah, I, um, I agree. And I think that brings up something else. That's like kind of like a really tough topic in our industry is the idea of the certification, because we get a lot of people that hit us up and they're like, Hey, is this certification? I'm like, no, they're like, am I going to learn everything I need? And I'm like, yes. And it's like, Oh, all right, never mind. It's like, okay. <laughs> it's like, right, it's hard because they just want the CEU or they just want something it's that... It's a paper yeah. and they want to be able to go, hey, I'm a mobility guy. I have the paper. And it's like, that's right. cool and everything. And I get it early in your career because like, A, most, a lot of gyms, you'll need it, you know? And then there's yeah. also all of the kind of like money grabs that really happen with the NASM stuff. Like, 
Am I really going to pay $200 to renew my NASM when I learn nothing right. from you guys anymore? Like, yeah. Do you, the do you, answer is but no. Do you have your exercise to music, sir? Yeah. That's, that's, the, one, <laughs> that's the one you need. Oh, can you sync exercise to a dope playlist? Because that's all anyone yeah. cares about these days. Yeah, they have the influencer one now, too, actually. Oh, that is insane. I is don't, it? An influencer cert. Oh, God. I don't even want to know. Don't oh, go down. God. Don't Let's not go down. You guys are in LA, right? Yeah, we're in LA. Okay, so like you guys got. Well, luckily we oh, moved yeah, to the yeah. mountains, so we we tried to we tried to escape. <laughs> well, we, get it the, we get it in the gym, obviously. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of that, a lot of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, everybody has like a four bags with like cameras in them. <laughs> oh yeah, it's we true. don't allow that. It's, yeah. Well, but some people have memberships. Some gyms specifically have influencer memberships that allow you yeah. to have your your whole camera crew and all that. We're like, if it's low key and we don't notice, then that's fine. But if it's getting in the way of things, then it ain't flying. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. We're living in we're living in strange times. But right. um, yeah, no. To go back to it, I do I do think there are great courses out there, and great certifications, um, specific to certain things. It's just hard to like point people in the right direction in terms of like one general thing that that I think is really good. Um, yeah, it's like get your cert so that way you're you your know you can't yeah your foot's in the door and you're allowed quote unquote to do it and then find some mentors uh, and then see what they're putting out there and if they got courses or if they have uh, you know trainings or and you know in person is great but the online stuff is just getting better and better. I will say there's there's a lot of great stuff coming out of Florida. I don't know what it is about Florida, but in terms of like the fitness industry, <laughs> so many people are based there. Like the N1 guy, I think he's in Florida, and then Ben, um, Ben Pukowski. Pukowski, how do you pronounce it? He's in Florida. Um, I mean, Ian's in Florida. The hy hypertrophy, hypertrophy coach, he's in yeah. Florida. You're yeah. in Florida. I'm like, a lot of the people. Because of uh, COVID. Yeah, right. that's true. Yeah, a lot of. Similar weather, just but a yeah. little wetter. But it's it's kind of like I see it. I do see it as kind of like the kind of like lead fitness hub right uh -huh, now because, yeah. like I said, a lot of people move there. A lot of people operate out of there. A lot of the videos I see are recorded there. Um, and yeah, I guess. So yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense as as a fitness. You know, like just like you guys are out in California. Like when you're when you're when you're not in the snow all year round, like people tend to care about how they look a little bit more. You know, oh, and they right. might be willing to work for it. And then when you're in areas that actually have money, you know, that's the best thing to do. Like, you know, it must be tough being in the middle of nowhere in the U S and trying to build a personal training business, you know, and like sure. the best yeah. trainer in your city makes $40 an hour. It's like, oh, right. sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, they um, I have a question in terms of like, uh, time management, because obviously time is a limited resource. Like if I want, if I, if I could do every day, what I really want to do, it would take me four hours to get everything done in terms of like, mobility work strength training conditioning drills all that kind of stuff uh how do you kind of navigate that with your with your clients especially like your your athletes who who do have like obviously limited time to train because then they have to do their sports specific stuff like how much time per day should they be uh, dedicating to to this kind of stuff like the mobility and breathing kind of work yeah i find the athletes actually the easiest because they kind of, it's kind of like, Hey, this is my career. So like my professional soccer guys, like, they'll be like, Hey, uh, yeah. You know, and I added this and I'm like, Oh, you added something. It's like, all right, well next week I added something. Now you have right. more time, you know? So like that happens a lot with the athletes. I find them the easiest because like, that's, Hey, this is my job. I have time. Right. What do I need to do? Um, but they also present another, uh, tough thing. And, and you kind of alluded to that, the idea that like, Hey, my, my person, my, my physical therapist said this, my Cairo said this, and the team trainer said this, and it's like, well, I disagree with all of them. Can I talk to them? No, it doesn't, it's probably not going to work. Okay, great. So I'll just go off of no information. All right, cool. So like, there's too many cooks in the kitchen with them, but for the most part, the athletes for me end up being easier. Now, the other people that don't have a lot of time, I just start them so slow. Um, I, I tend to get them to do like something really small first. Maybe, like I said, like doing 60 minutes of cardio is a really daunting to most of us. And it's actually pretty boring, obviously, especially zone two. But doing 20 minutes is really not that bad. And if you start with 20, you're going to be okay. And then as long as you're able to kind of increase, whether it's the intensity, the duration, whatever it might be over time, you're going to be golden. And the same thing with the mobility work, like start with the basics. I try to get people into routines because I think most people do 
uh, are very successful routines. I also think an underrated part of this whole conversation really is like how you market yourself, how you put yourself out there is who you're going to attract. So I'm not attracting the person that goes five minute abs, come on in, you know, or we're going to kill you today. Or, Hey, have you ever had your heart rate at 195? Like those people aren't finding me. The people that are finding me are like the ones who are like, Hey, so uh, I have 17 hours a week to train um, actually 17.5 every second week. And it's like, okay, relax, but we can do it in 10. You know, I got you. So starting with the morning breath routine is something that's really popular um, that I do. Um, the same soccer guys that I was just talking about, one of them just came back to me. He's like a year and a half into training with me. He's like, Hey, you know, like the breathing routine we started with, like I've been doing it again. And I'm like, all right, cool. He's like, yeah, I just threw it back in there. Like I liked it so much. So, you know, you kind of make them, um, you know, empower them in on their own way. And they'll end up even telling you what they need and what they want a lot of the time, especially the athletes, because they're so in tune with their bodies, but just starting with a routine and everybody needs something different is more going to be better. Yeah, of course. But it's not just about time. It's about how they're feeling. Are they actually going to give it their full effort? Do they feel like they're getting enough of the other stuff? So it's really a complicated thing that really comes down to communication also and really building that relationship with them. Because, you know, one of the things I'll ask them is like, hey, like if I give you too much and you don't do it, are you going to feel bad? And most of them will say yes. And then someone will be like, no, I don't care. It won't hurt me. At all. And I'm like, all right. So I'll give them seven days. And then if they do five, we just go, all right, cool. Make sure you get those two you missed next week. And then it's fine. But if I didn't communicate with that, that person and they missed two days and now they're so stressed out that they missed five days, then, and then they, you end up messing them up. So it's communication is really the biggest key. Yeah. You mentioned that morning breath routine. Is that like a fixed thing or is that different for everybody? Um, it starts off the same for everyone. So what I'll do is I'll share some notes with you guys so that I'll, I'll send you the links there. It's free on YouTube, but it just starts off. It's nine minutes long. Nine minutes. Uh, it, it teaches you how to use your core. You're going to do belly breathing, lateral breathing, and then elevator breathing, which is like the 360. Super simple. And it really sets up all of my training after that because those same concepts are going to go from the floor to everywhere else. And that start position should dramatically change from the zero to the ninth minute of the routine. By the time you're done with it, you should get up and be like, oh, all right, I feel good. This is what he's been talking about. Um, so yeah, that's that's something that I start standard with everybody. And it's not nine minutes every day or? Uh, yeah, ideally, ideally for sure. Nice. That would be, a, that'd be a, I think that would be a great thing to like introduce our community to. Um, do you have any more questions? I only have questions about your cute little two month old baby and how cute his name is, Maverick. That's so cute. <laughs> I love how you changed so much as soon as we started talking about the baby. That's awesome. Oh, uh, I, I love that you started doing like baby mobility and you're like, look at this neck flexion that we got going on. Look at look at this. And I'm like, yes, start them young and and applying, you know, letting people know that like development starts at birth and you're learning all these fundamental movements right from the get-go and a lot of times while they may not have the same motor control patterns as uh, as adults do they they learn it better from the start so they do it better than most adults um and so that's cool i'm sure you're learning a lot we have a two and a half year old um and it's it, like it's amazing to watch how movement progresses um and breathing progresses and all of that what you know uh, practicing and being able to witness it uh right from the get-go yeah i uh i obviously it's uh the greatest gift life has ever being a father um you know watching him develop is really cool too because i think i still think a lot of trainers even think that like you have this program in your body and you hit a button internally and then you squat you know and like that's just not how movement happens you know we're constantly bringing like afferents and stuff you know, information through all the senses of our body. And then we're having reflexes that happen right away. And we're having conscious decisions that go out. And that's what movement is. But I think we kind of get caught up in patterns and thinking that everything is just a press A, press B inside, and that's your pattern. But there's no clear sign that that's not true. when you watch your kid and you watch the way that they're just like, unbelievably jolty the whole time because like they don't know and like you're like hey do you want the pacifier and they're kind of like, yeah. like 
so like there's that attraction of oh i do want the pacifier and it's like how do i figure out how to do this and you just see just like you would teach your client a deadlift and they would struggle you see how they have a task in mind and they're trying to execute it with their information and it's not just this clear drug okay this is my hip hinge do it you know and then to see like you said they progress and then it becomes something that they constantly have but there's still variability within it is really cool and um yeah it's funny you know the the stage that i'm at right now with him where he's so young it's like part of me is just like man i just want you to grow up right now like a little bit so i can talk to you so we can play basketball right now so we can train but at the same time i'm like everybody's that's way smarter than me is always hey you know enjoy this time like this is where yeah. it's at like, it's yeah. good so i'm just trying to be as slow with this it does blink it really everyone says that and i'm like yeah okay i get it i get it and they're like enjoy it while it lasts and then yeah now he's two and a half years and he's like completing full sentences and like you know will you play with me and then like throwing balls and catching them and like is it and and is totally in that fun stage and definitely it's way more fun than uh, because when they're that young you're just trying to keep them from not killing themselves you know so that it's a lot more scary um so when they do have a lot more like movement and pattern and and conscious confidence um then it does become easier and a lot more fun but yeah enjoy it did you did you name him maverick before or after the movie the second movie came out absolutely no no uh no correlation between maverick at all yeah we really? uh, get asked that all the time and like it was funny because we named him and then like five weeks later we watched the scientology documentary on netflix and i was like wow we gotta let everybody know that he is not related to tom like and it was funny we have like you guys do the shared album so your whole family can see the pictures oh we need to get more into that uh, we do because right now especially with our uh uk family um it's we have you know a whatsapp link and try to send it but it's so much easier to just like like, take the photo, put it in the shared album. They can see it right away because, yeah, I, I know we got to get in that. I put, my, I put my dad on there and my dad posted, like, the theme, uh, like, logo for Maverick in there. And I was like, Dad, like, what that. Are you <laughs> delete, delete. Like, we don't want that at all. If anything, he would be more of um, Maverick Carter, who's, like, LeBron's business uh, partner. Um, if anything, uh, he would pick a Maverick. But we really just love the name and uh, – it's cool because one of my one of my good friends, his son's name is Colt, and my cousin's kid's name is Brooks, and it kind of like sounds like they're going to start a country band together. They are, yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, Pete wants to name our next one Rip after Yellowstone, and I'm like, <laughs> I, but just imagine five years from now in kindergarten, he will probably be one of ten Rips because of Yellowstone and the popularity that is. It does, it does work like that. We actually had someone on Facebook popped up, and it was like someone I went to high school with, and they named her kid Maverick, and I, I showed my uh, my girl, and she was just like, no. Nah. Nah, that's not him. He's not Maverick. I'm like, all right, cool. It's not a big deal. Our uh, our baby shower is actually Yellowstone themed. So. Yes. Oh, awesome. oh, so good. That's great. <laughs> Ian, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. That was awesome. Uh, thank you for your insight. Uh, fascinating to talk to you. Um, and we'll put like a bunch of links on the on the on the show notes to 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 your. To your Instagram, course, your website, but to the discount code for the stick, yeah, uh, all that uh, stuff. Just so everyone who's listening knows, where where is the best place to to find you, to reach out to you, etc. Yeah, so um, Ian Marco, so I N M A R K O W on Instagram. We also have our Instagram that's Marco Training Systems, at, so at Marco Training Systems. Um, YouTube, a lot of stuff. You guys will see the links in the show notes, but um, yeah, feel free to DM me. Um, you know, uh, I get a lot of people that DM me. They're like, "Hey, Marco," so like definitely DM me. Hey, Ian, since that's my name. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to talk to anybody and answer any questions. So um, thank you guys so much for having me on. Awesome, awesome. And if you ever make it out to Los Angeles, you gotta you gotta come to the gym and check it out. Um, yeah, I think you'll like sure, it. Sure. Actually, the the way that I heard about you guys is Brandon um, was like, "Hey, you know, you're out here. You guys should you should reach out and try to get a class uh, going on you guys or do a workshop." So yeah, which yeah, would be great. That, Next yeah. time you're doing that, we should absolutely coordinate something. We'd love to have you. Let's do it. We'll definitely do that. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll we'll catch up with you soon. See you, man. Have a great day. Thank yeah. you.